It's 2024, and From Software's name has reached legendary status in the gaming industry. For the past decade and a half, it really seems like every game they release does little to no wrong and is able to redefine what key features of game design are for the most part. For their bread and butter, their expertise in level and enemy design, atmosphere, world building, cryptic but enchanting storytelling, and of course, boss fights, spawned its own mini genre. What we all know, as Souls-like. Games that provide a hard to master difficulty, but are the most rewarding and engaging experiences we've played. And up until Liza P showed up last year, no other developer that made their own Souls-like was able to touch or even come close to what From Software has been able to achieve with the Souls series. But the one game that always seems to be overlooked when discussing From success is the one that started it all, the very first foray into the Souls-like genre. That, my friends, is Demon Souls. Everything that has made From Software successful, every mechanic, every boss, every level, every single thing that is beloved about the Souls series can be traced back to Demon Souls, the game that started it all. Without it, none of all this exists. So why is this the case? Why is it constantly being overshadowed by its contemporaries? Why was it unable to cultivate the massive fanbase and cultural influence that its sequel did? Because this game deserves much more recognition than it has gotten. So, let's give that recognition today, shall we? So strap in, boys and girls, and let's get down to business. Now, full disclosure, the footage and points that I'll be covering will pertain to Bluepoint's 2020 remake, as that's the version that I played, and since it's very faithful to the original, I think I get a pass here, right? We in agreement? Okay, break. Now, to understand Demon's Souls and how it was received, you have to go all the way back to 2009 when the game first launched. Now, just listen to this lineup that we got in 2009. Assassin's Creed 2, Batman Arkham Asylum, Dragon Age Origins, Modern Warfare 2, Uncharted 2, Left 4 Dead 2, damn, I, I hope you like sequels, Borderlands, Ice Age Dawn of the Dinosaurs, oh, and we also saw the release of everyone's favorite babysitting tool, Minecraft. So. Yeah, 2009 was full of nothing but bangers. All of these games were positioned as player-friendly, things you can just sit down and have a good time with. And in the case of the shooters, it was a time to hang out and play a game with friends online after a long day of work. And these developers rightfully catered to players that sought these type of games out. So when players first saw Demon's Souls, they saw it as any other fantasy RPG with knights, dragons, and castles, and they were expecting a game like the ones they played. But uh... What they got instead was... Demon's Souls was a fucking joke game. It was super easy. What, I died once on Flame Worker and that was it? <laughs> Players were blindsided. They had no answers. This was the first time they got hit with something like this and they genuinely didn't know how to respond to it. This was so bad that when the game was first shown off in 2008 in Japan, players freaking hated it! When it was presented to players in demos, they all thought that the combat was going to be more like a hack and slash, and when they were hit with reality in the form of the Dragon God straight right, they were turned off. Hell, they went so far as to call the game's combat unfinished. Even Shuhei Yoshida, Sony's president at the time, thought it was a terrible game. I can't believe I'm about to say this, this man couldn't make it past the beginning after two hours of playtime. Bro became a walking skill issue. The game is weak. The game is weak. F***ing game is weak? You're weak. Carrying over from that, a mind-blowing stat that I saw was that according to trophy statistics back on the original PS3 release, around 17.2% of players could not make it past the Phalanx Demon. That is 380,000 players. I'm gonna repeat that stat. 380,000 people could not make it past the Phalanx Demon, which means 380,000 people could not even make it to the part of the game where your character unlocks the ability to level up. For those of you that don't know, let me show you how you beat the Phalanx Demon. Done, gentlemen. Your work here today has made the Chancellor a very happy man. 
Nowadays, after playing every Souls game, we can run through Demon Souls like it's nothing, but back in 2009, nobody had ever seen anything like this. Enemies taking chunks of your health this big? For context, in 2007, this is how much health you lost in God of War when an enemy hits you. Can you see it? Yeah, I can't either. This is how much health you lose when an enemy hits you in Demon Souls. Again, doesn't seem like much now, but you just saw the difference in games just two years apart. It also didn't help that the enemies didn't sit back and twiddle their thumbs. Every single one was in attack mode. Unlike Assassin's Creed 2, that very same year, they sat around like goons and waited for you to counter. Imagine going from this to this. <laughs> This game also brought along the Corpse Run, which introduced the idea of losing your gathered currency, or souls, upon death, and having to make it back to the same spot you died to retrieve them. If you die before you get there, those souls disappear forever. And all that work you just did in the last 10 minutes, poof, down the drain. This stressed players out even more, because you need souls to level up your character and buy items throughout the game, and losing all your souls you got from enemies that didn't curb stomp you can leave you feeling absolutely demoralized. The difficulty, while not as refined as in later games, was mistaken by some as unfair. But no, that's not the case at all, for the most part. Allow me to explain why. Now, Demon's Souls has some factors of difficulty that I don't agree with, and I'll touch on much later, but for the most part, Souls' difficulty is described using the good old adage, hard, but fair. The difficulty primarily comes from enemy damage being higher than in other games, and the enemies themselves being in constant attack mode like I said earlier, and because of that, there's very little room for error. And it also introduced levels that became hostile to you too, just look at the value of defilement. Not every enemy is going to take a chunk of your health with every hit, but become careless for long and you might end up getting ganked and stunlocked in areas where you really shouldn't be. But the beauty of the difficulty is that the enemies are brittle too. Aside from boss battles, there's no enemies that are health sponges, and I wouldn't even really consider the bosses health sponges. So they can be taken out as easy or easier than you can, most of the time in two or three hits. It's also reliant on reading the enemy's movements and knowing when to roll out of the way and counter which when you figure that out, you can absolutely trivialize the game. The difficulty different players will experience will also vary depending on what builds you go for. Basic melee class, tank defenders, mage builds that are cheap as hell. Everyone's experience will be different and that is where the difficulty shines because there is a way around everything. And if you find yourself stuck in one area, then you're more than welcome to back out of that area, go somewhere else, level up, and then come back to that same area that was giving you problems, and you can have more success. But one critical factor that puts the bow on Soul's difficulty is one small but very important little thing, your stamina. Every action you take in-game, aside from walking and using magic, costs stamina. Remember how I said players were expecting a hack and slash back in the day? Yeah, you can hack and slash away in Devil May Cry like there's no tomorrow, but the stamina bar puts restrictions on what you can do in a certain span of time. And you can use it all in a four hit combo, but you won't be able to do anything else, like dodge the counter attack that's about to strike you. It forced players to manage their actions and actually put thought into their approach. Maybe hit three times and back off to let it recharge. We might not think about this as hard now, but stamina is the backbone of Souls games, and the challenge would not be the same without it. And to supplement this, the game also utilized PvP through summoning, which is where you can call out to other players, real players, that have put down their summon sign in your world to assist you in a certain area. Most commonly, this is used for boss fights, which you won't find me using, not even in this video. And through the jolly cooperation in the game, players and developers alike can leave little messages that give you advice or are just pretty much there to screw with you. And you can also find blood stains throughout the world, which shows you how other players have died and what you should be prepared for as well. All of this centers around the player getting into a groove with the gameplay. And that is the best description I can give for Souls difficulty. Once you get into a groove, the game becomes easy. Getting into that groove is the hard part. The point is that you can overcome anything in Demon Souls. You just need to have patience, adaptability, nope, not that shit, and the ability to learn through failure. And once you have that down, nothing in this game is going to stand in your way. But difficulty is obviously not the only thing that Demon Souls offers. It also introduces the minimalistic storytelling that FromSoftware is famous for. Unlike most of the game's sequels, 
Demon Souls' plot is more clear-cut and easy to understand. Hunting for demons? Try one of the arch stones. Now go. That is why you came, is it not? To this accursed Boletaria. You learn how the kingdom of Boletaria under King Alant found unprecedented prosperity through channeling the power of souls. But one day Alant ended up rousing the Old One, an ancient beast that nearly destroyed the world from its slumber, which looks a lot like your mom. Which brought in a deep colorless fog that cut off Boletaria from the outside world, and brought forth demons that hunted men and took their souls. We learn that Valarfax of the Royal Twin Fangs was able to break through the fog and tell the rest of the world about what's really happening in Boletaria, and the power of souls, and more importantly, Demon Souls. What else did you think it would be? Attracted by the prospect of acquiring a demon soul and gaining power beyond human comprehension, heroes from across the land venture into the fog, hoping to gain a demon soul for themselves. Heroes, including us. We enter the fog, get hit with a reality check, and find ourselves in the Nexus, a hidden temple that holds the world together, and the last safe refuge for those that have survived the demon scourge where we meet our guide and everyone's favorite foot fetish idol, Fee! the Maiden in Black, who explains that the Nexus is binding our souls to the world, so we can't truly die. After completing the first area of Boletaria, the Maiden informs us, The Monumental awaits the above. We go all the way up the stairs and find a room filled with dead babies? Uh, all right, God, this is pretty messed up. Maybe take it down and- Oh my God, one's still alive! The Monumental explains that once the world was united, using the power of the soul arts, until the Old One was awakened, nearly destroying the fabric of reality. The Monumental sealed the Old One away, but most of the world was destroyed, so in order to preserve what was left, they constructed six arch stones to protect the remaining parts of the world, sealed the Old One below the Nexus, and banned the use of soul arts. But since nobody decided to listen, that's where we come in, and are entrusted to lull the Old One back to slumber and save the world. Upon clearing out each area and taking out all the arch demons, the giant seal on the Nexus breaks, and you dive down to meet the Old One, because you are now powerful enough to attract its attention. You are faced with a final choice. Either let the Maiden put the beast back to sleep, or kill her and take control of the Old One for yourself, becoming all-powerful. It's a simple enough story to follow, and though you meet some twists and turns along the way, it's all just a backdrop for what Demon Souls really offers. Demon Souls' teaching comes from its level design. From the moment you start in the tutorial, you are met with basic enemies, all easy but gradually get more complex with each encounter, and it does exactly what a tutorial should do, teach you the basics of gameplay. And then you get to the Vanguard and... The Nexus is your hub world, where every sane person left in Boletaria goes to seek refuge from the cruel world overrun by giant demons, and where demon slayers themselves go to regroup and restock on whatever they need before venturing back out again. In terms of hub worlds, the Nexus is one of the best in the entire series. In fact, despite the majority of From Software's hub worlds being great, you could make the argument that the Nexus is the best hub world in the series because of the amount of resources at your disposal and the amount of NPCs that come through to give more context about themselves and the lore of the land. Not to mention it's also where you go to touch the demon inside me and use souls to level up your character. And if you walk all the way upstairs, you can also see various online stats about which players have the most kills or completed the most challenges. Cool little way to give players a little recognition for their accomplishments in such an unforgiving game like this. And in the remake, the place is just visually stunning. The color scheme, the background music, and the runes that definitely didn't inspire Elden Ring. The Nexus also acts as the main level select screen with the five arch stones that connect to each of the world and the respective levels all popularly designated number-wise in the order they appear. Boletarian Palace is the main area of the game, and it's where you start and you finish your journey, typically. Your typical area filled with castles, knights, and dragons. The first area has you battling through similar grunts and soldiers found in the tutorial, and it introduces the stronger blue knights and the very, very strong in the beginning red knights if the player wants an extra challenge. Though, bring a shield because this charge would make Champion Gundyr proud. You also got the red dragon roaming around the levels just waiting for you to walk onto a bridge where it's just like, hey, I got a date with a blue dragon in five minutes. Can you smell my breath? You could try killing it in the second area with a method that's been passed down through time, but this is just tedious and ain't nobody got time for that. This is where you meet your first NPC out in the world, Ostrava, who is completely incapable of handling grunts. Bro, look at your sword. I think you'll be fine. All right, here, watch. Now I take my leave. There is something... I must do. 
No. No, I don't think you will. This is a great starting area because it involves enemies that are relatively easy and straightforward to deal with, so you learn basic mechanics from them. And it's a great place for farming grass since that game utilizes an item system for healing. Now, I've seen people criticize this system mostly for the fact that if you run out, you have to either grind for more grass or use souls to purchase them from a vendor. And I can completely understand why people hate this, but I'm not one of those people that hate it, at least not as much as everybody else does. Mainly because the best areas to farm grass are the gates of Boletaria and later the inner ward, both of which are the best areas in the game in my opinion. And in the case of the gates of Boletaria, when you go back to farm, you'll be so overpowered that you carve through everybody in one hit. So there's no real danger unless you play stupid. Now, do I prefer the flask method over this? Absolutely. But am I going to go complain at my local town hall about it? No. Stonefang Tunnel is a little more complex, where it forces you to deal with the scale miners who can't be beat with simple swipe attacks, so the player needs to utilize stab and magic attacks to the best of their ability. What's such a great detail about this level is that the regular miners don't attack you. As the level description states, the miners are dispossessed of their souls, have no thoughts of their own, and work in silence tirelessly and without purpose. They are so preoccupied with their work that they don't even bother to notice you, much less see you as a threat. Uh, until you put a tool in their hand and then it's workers of the world unite! This is also the first level where you encounter the fat officials. Now, I'm not a fan of fat shaming, but with these guys, um, I'm sorry buddy, is this a joke to you? Yes, it is. Now suck <laughs> <laughs> That'll teach you to laugh in my face. Now go sign up for a walkathon, chunky. You also have the later level where you deal with more fire-oriented enemies that don't really take much damage to regular weapons, so it's important to utilize magic attacks and magic-based weapons like the Crescent Falchion to deal with them. The Tower of Latria is... Oh, shit. The Tower of Latria is the best area in the game when it comes to atmosphere, because the entire first area is a giant prison filled with the grunting and screaming of its inmates. All right, guys, I got the key. Let's bounce. All right, the jailers are going to be here soon. Uh, or not. Uh, I, I, I guess they're stuck. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh my God, they're hitting the gritty. The lightning in the background. And in the remake, you have the distant singing of the end credits theme. Which, when you investigate further, you actually find it's coming from the one last sane prisoner, the former noble's wife. But what makes this level so terrifying is the ever-present sound of the ringing bells of Santa's sleigh. Say hello to the cheapest enemy in the game and the first on my From Software list of cheap enemies. The Mind Flayers in the Tower of Latria come complete with a way too wide magical burst, a stun ray, a long range spell, and the once in a lifetime opportunity to make out with an octopus. Though I wasn't planning on becoming a VTuber today. When Twitch changes their sexual content guidelines. <laughs> One mistake with these guys and you could be stun locked into oblivion. So players need to rush them and give them no chance to attack. Because in the early game, they deal extremely high damage. And if you're in soul form, their spells are almost a guarantee to be a two shot. The overall atmosphere coupled with the constant reminder to be on guard for a mind flayer makes the prison of hope level in the Tower of Latria an unforgettable experience. The Shrine of Storms introduces... They see me rolling. These are the beefiest skeletons I've ever seen. Alright, those guys are done. Now to just deal with the archers. Yeah, that's how you do- Oh shit! Hey guys, what's your favorite food? Eggplant roll of teens? <laughs> oh shit, I don't think you like that. So after you deal with the roly-poly boys, you get your first taste of the Storm Beasts. Flying stingrays bent on the destruction of all humankind. And you also run into... Oh hey Vanguard! Oh, you still can't move past this spot, can you? Oh, oh, you know what that means. I am a genius. It's also where you find the best weapon in the game. Now I could talk about the next area, but I got words for that later. And finally, 
the Valley of Defilement, also known as the first of many poison levels in From Software games. Now, a lot of people have a complete disdain for this area, but I'm actually not in that group. Yeah, it's annoying when you're forced to walk slow through a poisonous swamp and you have to dodge big stupid jellyfish in order to make it to the other side, but the annoyances are nowhere near close to game ruining, and it takes a pretty long while for the poison to build up anyway, plus the damage you receive from it is not really substantial. On top of that, you have your basic enemies that will sometimes charge you for a combo, and then attack you at a distance with their fire spears, and you also got their older varsity city athlete brothers that always seem to show up when you're on narrow paths. This specifically teaches the player, when in doubt, run back to where you were so you have more area to work with. Is this my favorite area? No. But is it bad? Also no. It's just inconvenient more than anything else. And that's exactly where the challenge comes from. The world will not always give you an easy ride, so how are you going to deal with it? It's recommended that you save the last two areas for the end of the game when you built up more poison resistance from leveling up your character, and definitely do the first level last when going across the first phase of the level spectrum. All of these areas present a different challenge to the player, and teach them different things they need to survive in Boletaria, and if you can learn and grow from them, then you have what it takes to beat Demon Souls. But as we all know, the levels are only the teaser for what we really came here for. You know what we're talking about next. The boss, baby. There's a reason why the bosses in Souls games are held up as the standard bearer for the industry. Whenever you ask gamers about some of their favorite boss fights, there's a good shot one of them will be from a Souls game. And as Demon's Souls was the first of its kind, it was also the first to introduce this specific type of boss design. What separates it from the rest of the industry is, for one, the game treats its boss fights like an event and not just an extension of the level itself. Aside from having cool designs and being intimidating, for the most part, it's further amplified by being the only time when you hear music throughout the game, besides in your hub world. As you spent most of the game in complete silence with only your footsteps, armor, and environmental sounds to accompany you, the loud bombastic tune that accompanies a challenging boss makes the encounter that much more meaningful and makes them the definitive high notes of the game since everything else is so low key. Because of this, Souls bosses are not just part of the game, they're the main attraction of the game, and they perfectly represent the challenge at hand for the player. The most prominent iteration of this is the game's most iconic boss, the Tower Knight. This guy is the perfect representation of the overall theme of Demon's Souls, a small, weak individual looking to overcome impossible odds. You don't even need to play the game in order to understand the Tower Knight's massive scale. Anyone can take one look at this guy and instantly think, wait, I have to beat this thing? Fully clad in armor, with a tiny sword. How is this supposed to work? And when you take him down, Literally, it's so cathartic. Now, it wasn't the first game to utilize random pattern design for bosses. Devil May Cry and Ninja Gaiden are the ones that come to mind in the early 2000s. But what Demon's Souls did to elevate this boss design is that it gave its bosses the attack power of a freight train for back then. I know it's nothing compared to what we got now. I mean, just look at this. This made the fight that much more intense because the penalty of misreading a boss's tell is so much larger and one mistake could mean bye-bye to a huge chunk of your health and sent all the way back to the beginning of the level. The moment you encounter the Vanguard in the tutorial, he proceeds to play Home Run Derby with your ass, which informs the player very early on that the moment you step through that fog wall, you had better be on your A game. But tying back to my point earlier about difficulty, as soon as you begin to read the boss's tells, you can dodge, dip, dive, duck, and dodge circles around them. For instance, my first ever playthrough, I died to the armored spider at least 20 times. I, I just couldn't get past his web shots. I'm not ashamed to admit it. But on my second playthrough, I beat him on my first attempt. And now every attempt since, I've beaten him on my first attempt, because I now know what movements to watch out for and when to react at the right time. While future installments had the chance to add more fine-tuning and complexity to their bosses, the bosses in Demon's Souls present a different challenge, and it's up to the player to figure out which mechanic the game is trying to test them on. And each one brings something unique to the table. The Phalanx and Leechmonger teach you that you shouldn't be afraid to use items in a fight, especially fire since it melts them like chocolate. The Armored Spider teaches you to look closely at Tells, as it has different movements for its fire shot and web shot that I found out the hard way. And once you get in close, it teaches you both blocking and positioning, as its swipe can easily be blocked by a shield, and as long as you're in the middle, its chop won't touch you. Now, the Fool's Idol truly denigrated me as a man, because I have more problems on this boss than most others in the game. 
This I am ashamed to admit. It forces you to be attentive and aware of your surroundings as she puts down magical stun traps around the arena that disappear the moment they're put down. If you walk into the traps when she has her clones around, take a wild guess what happens next. Just like Ron Burgundy, the old hero is blind, so the fight has you moving slowly to avoid having him hear and react to your presence, and another cool thing, if you have on the thief's ring, he's basically a sitting duck, since it lowers the sound of your movements, and he can't hear or see you at all. It's a nice way to reward players who've been exploring the world. Now the intensity ramps up when you meet the Flame Lurker, who in my opinion, is the best boss in the game. This is the archetype for future Souls Beast bosses, and a big difficulty spike. Because up until this point, the bosses have had clear gimmicks and solutions to solve them. But Flame Lurker's just like, ha ha ha. But it's opposite day. Oh no! From the jump, he's constantly running at you and doling out quicker and stronger attacks. Oh, down goes Frazier! And just when you think you've dodged, you get caught up in the explosion when he slams his fist down. Every dodge encounter means everything because he gives you much less time to react and reposition. And players need to be quick with healing because he can close in on you like that. This is a freaking thrill ride and you love every second of it. Not counting his run back. The Maneaters introduce the player to two-on-one -on -one boss fights, and it instills an instant feeling of panic when the other one shows up, because when you're finally making some headway on the first one, and now just another one shows up, you're completely thrown off your game and are just blindsided. Ultimately, the fight teaches players how to manage their damage output before the other one shows up, and it provides a great oh shit moment. So we've had the most iconic, the best, and now we got the coolest boss fight. Say hello to the Penetrator, the first real knight fight in the game, whose intro is absolutely badass. So badass that I don't want to risk the monetization I just got, so go look it up yourself. The fight itself is a basic roll check, testing you on your reaction time, but it feels so good to dodge and avoid his... <clears throat> penetrate. This guy stinks! This is not particularly hard, especially if you've played every other Souls game before this one, but it just feels great to play and counter, and it feels like a real duel between two badass knights. The Archdemons are the cap on each area, and unfortunately this is where we have a lot of hit and miss. The majority of them are unfortunately gimmick fights, and some work, like the Storm King that's easy when you get the Storm Ruler, but I mean just look how epic this is. And the sound design, whoever at Bluepoint was in charge of the sound design for the Storm King, you need a raise. Like, right now. The old monk brings in online players to be the boss, which is cool, but when you get the basic version, it's just an NPC fight, and it the fight just turns into a joke. I mean, look at this, I'm not even breaking a sweat. The challenge is completely gone. The Dragon God is, by far, the biggest missed opportunity, because he's in all of the promotion for the game, he looks absolutely badass, but it's not really a boss fight, and it's rather a stealth section straight out of Metal Gear Solid. Otacon, you watch a lot of anime. How do I take this thing down? Oh, th this is gonna be a tricky one, Snake. That's the Dragon God, an ancient demon that was once- Okay, oh yeah, Otacon, listen, this video's long enough as it is. J just tell me how to beat him. Oh, well, I guess you're right. You see those ballistas on each side of the arena? You're going to have to make your way to each of them. Then you could shoot the ballista and damage him. They should be powerful enough to pierce the scales of the Dragon God. Ballistas, huh? Well, I guess if you can't have Stinger missiles. But be careful, Snake. You can't let the Dragon God spot you or else- The mission is a failure. Cut the power right now. Turn the game console off right now. The fact that the Dragon God has this amazing design that he does, and this is what his boss fight was reduced to? Big mistake. And for as good as what Maiden Astraya makes the player feel, the fight can be fought in one of three ways. And neither one of them is fun. 
You post up on the right side and just pelt her to death with arrows for 84 years. You go up the middle and get plagued instantly and gangbanged by aborted babies. Yes, I'm pretty sure that's what these are. Or, what most sane players do, you go around the left side and you fight Garl Vinland himself, who just stands there and is supposed to make you draw him out and counter. He's the real boss this fight, as when he dies, Maiden Astraea just ceases to exist. However, let's take a detour here. What Astraea's fight lacks in gameplay, she makes up for in storytelling and lore. And for the more attentive player, the deeper you get, the more you start to question everything you've done up until this point. Allow me to explain. Throughout the game, you hear people telling rumors that she's become an archdemon herself. How many years has it been since that witch Astraea came to this valley with that squid-headed knight? Those ridiculous white robes of hers. I swear I caught her glaring at my son in disgust. Yes, it's true. She's as nasty as they come. And she's a demon to boot. Not that it surprises me. Have you heard the rumors about Astraea of the Valley of Defilement? They claim that she and her loyal knight have become demons and lead a clan of degenerate miscreants. In truth, the rumors are surely unfounded. There are all sorts of wrongdoers down there who would think up such nonsense. Yet, if the rumors are true, then may she be eternally damned for her debasement of the Lord's name. But when you show up, she's just sitting there. A regular woman wearing white robes, so you know she's pure. Okay, but for real, I'm gonna need an explanation why you're surrounded by dead bodies in a river of blood. I, I really think that would clear some things up. As soon as she and Garl Vinland start talking, Things get muddied even more. Leave us, Slayer of Demons. This is a sanctuary for the lost and wretched. There is nothing here for you to pillage or plunder. Please, leave quietly. Why must you pests insist on intruding upon our haven? You abandoned us long ago. What right do you have? We live humble lives. Leave us be. Think of every demon you fought up until this point, and then look at her. Hell, she doesn't exactly fight back, really, and Garl just stands in defense until you get close enough. They're not exactly looking for a fight, so this signals to you, the player, Alright, something's not right here. If you've been following the lore, the first description on the Valley of Defilement's level says the inhabitants offer their souls to the one woman who's shown them compassion. The one woman who's shown them compassion? No, no, I've heard this before. That's exactly what the fool's idol did in the Tower of Latria. But no, this seems different. This really feels like she has good intentions for the forgotten and decrepit inhabitants of the Valley of Defilement, and it seems like she truly does want to make things better. I mean, it hasn't worked so far, but baby steps, right? But it doesn't matter. She has a demon soul. And for that, she must die. But this time it's different. That sense of accomplishment and satisfaction you got with the other demons is not here. Because you truly do not know whether or not you just did the right thing. And if this is to be believed, and this woman truly sought to help the people of the valley, while I just got done slaughtering an entire hut encampment in the swamp, Who's the bad guy here? Okay, to be fair, they did strike first, and I'm just the Empire that strikes back, but they must have seen me as the invader, someone who's looking to harm the one woman who has shown them kindness. Which turns out, is exactly what I came here to do. And they couldn't do a damn thing about it. Damn, th this is deep. L let's finish this up, shall we? The final boss, False King Alant, is the penultimate showdown with the man who has been manipulating the entire event of the game. Leading up to the fight, you take a long elevator ride up to him, and you have the entire time to think about what could possibly be at the other end of this ride and what to expect. But j just enter the fog well immediately or else just... Oh, God damn it! When the fight starts, his attacks come in fast, using projectiles, conjuring storms, and even stealing your soul level? What? Yes, this man has a grab attack that lowers your current level. I mean, at this point, you're still powerful enough to beat him, but... Really, dude? Overall, the bosses and Demon Souls are largely simple in their design, but through the various challenges they introduce, the player can overcome them and become stronger as a result, both in-game and as a gamer.
Despite all of this, Demon's Souls had trouble connecting in the same way its sequels did. But why? Why did it have trouble connecting? Well, it doesn't help that you initially sell it as a console exclusive only in Japan. But aside from that, this is where the flaws of the game come in. For starters, when you die in Demon's Souls, you lose half your health until you defeat a boss. What? Um, excuse me? I get what they were going for. Really, I get the concept. But half of your health? Gone for the next run. You can use a stone of ephemeral eyes to restore your body, but there's a finite amount of these in the world and you really only should use these when absolutely necessary. Players can also find the cling ring in the first level to make it so that you only lose 25% of your health upon death. But since you need to keep it on at all times in order to keep that 75%, and since you only have two ring slots, it severely limits your ability to experiment with different stat buffs. Another thing, while not necessarily a flaw, but definitely a turnoff, if you die, you have to go all the way back to the beginning of the Archstone. There's no checkpoints, no save points, nothing. You can open shortcuts to make the trick back easier, and since the levels are smaller in nature, it's not the end of the world, but not every level has convenient shortcuts, or any at all. Enter the Ritual Path. Look at this path. Yeah, I said I'd have words for this later. Well, welcome to later. The second area in the Shrine of Storms has one of the worst boss run backs I've ever seen. You start off at the Archstone, then have to make your way down to the second level of the room where a Reaper is summoning wraiths. Get down, kill him, walk out, walk along a narrow path with skeletons rolling after you and an archer picking you off. Then you have to get past two more heavy skeletons that hit like bricks and can block your attacks. All of this going on, by the way, while you have storm beasts shooting their crystal meth at you with very little cover to hide behind. You then walk into a cave and have another narrow path to deal with, with freaking wraiths with freaking lasers on their freaking heads that you can't iframe out of or I I've never been able to do it. You deal with more regular wraiths before discovering there's now assassin wraiths that can backstab you. You run into more of each type of wraith before having to deal with the reaper that's on the other side of another narrow pathway that also has a razor that also has a laser wraith on the far side shooting at you. And then realize if you die at any point throughout this process, oh, too bad, bitch, do it again. Does this sound like fun to you? What can I say except you gave? Thank God the old hero is the boss of this area, because if there was a flame lurker type boss here, I probably would have never finished the game, and I think a lot less people wouldn't finish it either. Much less agonizing, but the shortcut to the flame lurker has you dropping down onto wooden planks, leaning down onto the ground floor. But be sure not to miss a plank! But perhaps the biggest problem that most people have with this game, and the biggest problem that I have, is world tendency. Oh, here we go. This game tried to implement a type of morality system, which on paper isn't a bad idea, but the execution of it just served to frustrate people and really kind of ruin the game in some aspects. You have different world tendencies for each archstone, from white to black, and depending on your actions in game, it would make the experience easier or harder. Again, this all sounds good, until you realize that death in your body form causes the world's tendency to become more black. In other words, every time you die, everything gets harder. Is this some kind of twisted joke? Enemies become tougher and they deal more damage, and you get black phantoms that spawn in at the most inconvenient places, with some just straight up blocking your path forward. Like, like look at this. Are you kidding me? From what I can gather, you don't lose any tendency if you die in soul form, but this is also the form where you have half of your health. So you got a choice, go full power but risk making the game harder, or no risk and be handicapped until you kill the boss. In a game that is centered around the difficulty. And apparently, it only takes four deaths in body form to shift the game from neutral to pure black. Oh. So that explains why I'm suddenly at pure black at the final area, and now Bior is attacking me when he's supposed to be distracting the dragon. Four times? That's it? I was going to help you, but there is no place in this world for weak maidenless bitches like you. Wait, wait, Bior, I only died four times. Please, look at the amount of demons I killed. UNACCEPTABLE! So players that have stocked up on Stones of Ephemeral Eyes, like I did, for the whole game in preparation for the final level, get punished for that if they die? 
What the hell kind of system is this? By the way, none of this is explained to you. You have to either find out the hard way or the Google way. They also made it so that world tendency is tied to certain side quests, meaning you have to either have pure white or pure black tendency in order to progress certain quest lines and also access different parts of the areas. So you either had to have not died at all or died very little and killed an archdemon to get pure white, at which point you're already done with the area. Gee, thanks. Or die so many times in body form and kill random NBCs to get pure black. But at this point, unless you're actively seeking it, how would you even know or even care? From Software also must have thought this about the mechanic because World Tendency hasn't appeared in any other Souls game since. And frankly, the games have been better for it. So, Demon Souls unfortunately did not perform well enough to gain mass appeal. So much so that Sony was unwilling to publish the game outside of Japan, a decision that Sony execs now considered a big mistake. But no worry, Atlas picked up the game and ended up publishing it in the US, and word of mouth gained it a small cult following and some outlets even giving it their 2009 Game of the Year. But it's okay, cult following in this case is completely fine, because Demon Souls did its job. And because of the positive word of mouth, From Software got a renewed vigor to follow up on this. With Bandai Namco as its new publisher, they would take the foundation laid by Demon Souls and use it to build a dynasty. For the start of a genre that we all love and the mechanics that it introduced, Demon Souls without question gets a 9 out of 10. Alright guys, thanks for watching. If you've watched all the way through, one down. We're running through the entire Souls series this year, hopefully in the first two months, so you know what's up next. If you guys like the video, please drop a like and subscribe to ZD Boy because, of course, this is the only place to get content this damn good. Alright everybody, once again, thanks for watching and I'll see you all next time.